Clap your hands for Conor McGrath, everybody. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. Thank you, everybody at Lincoln's Bar and Grill on Market Street. I am so excited to be here for the first taping of the Laugh Shack special, the annual Laugh Shack special. This will be the next version of the Young Comedian specials that were on Comedy Central in the 80s. So I'm excited to make the first edition, the Prime Cuts. I'm so excited to be here. My name is Connor McGrath. I'm your penultimate comedian of the evening. I will tell you a few things about myself over the next 14 and a half minutes of stage time that I have. My name is Connor McGrath. I come from the Deering Center neighborhood of Portland, Maine. We are in Portland, so there's not a lot of recognition applause break for that. I know that, but we live here. Fuck you. Uh, <laughs> from the Deering Center neighborhood of Portland, Maine, and I have Asperger's Syndrome, which is on the autistic spectrum. Uh, sometimes joke uh, bookers say, don't do that joke. It makes audiences feel awkward and uncomfortable. <laughs> and I say, you know what is awkward and uncomfortable? Having Asperger's Syndrome. I'm just trying to relate stories of my life to the audience, like any other comedian. <laughs> I uh, get some questions sometimes about having Asperger's Syndrome. Uh, one of them is a lot of people ask me if I'm a savant, if I'm a genius, if I know a lot about certain intricate subjects. If I'm a savant, a genius who knows a lot about particular intricate subjects, like Connor, do you know, are you a savant? Do you know a lot about the Euro rail, the rail system of Europe, the rails, the trains of Europe? Do you know a lot about the Euro rail? Do you know a lot about the International Court of Law at The Hague? Do you know a lot about Mozart and Brahms and classical composers? And I say, it's not quite the case. <laughs> I know less about the Euro Rail and the International Court of Law at The Hague and Mozart and Brahms and more about Greyhound bus lines <laughs> who wrestled in every intercontinental title match at WrestleMania <laughs> and the insane clown posse. <laughs> I have what you call low-class, high-functioning autism. That's... Sometimes people ask me if I, uh, if I understand social cues, social cues, the unspoken conversation. <laughs> that it's very easy for a lot of, uh, some neurotypicals, that's what we call non-autistic people in our community, to understand the unspoken social conversation. Can you pick up on social cues? I'm like, I'm getting a lot better at picking up on social cues through a lot of just hanging out and being social at comedy shows and just learning about people. I can now pick up on social cues. Uh, problem is, they're from 10 years ago. That's when I, a little bit delayed reaction. But I, uh, I was just thinking back to August of 2006 the other day, because it was August 2016 the other day, and uh, thinking about Daring Drama Summer Boot Camp. And uh, we were rehearsing some scenes, and some uh, lady, nice young lady, and the, that was in the Daring Drama Club with me, decided to sit in my lap. <laughs> I was thinking back at that small moment, and I was thinking, Huh, that girl probably would have had sex with me because no woman over the age of 15 ever sits in a man's lap unless it's Santa Claus or she wants to have sex with him or she's getting paid to or she's getting paid to have sex with Santa Claus. Those are the only... And we weren't doing Miracle on 34th Street that fall, so I think that girl wanted me to sling the D. But all too... I'll let, I'll let that soak in a little bit. Sling the D. Use that one. Uh, 
It's not a Conor McGrath creation. I, like, I got a credit to somebody on the internet. I don't know who. Uh, I all, but all I could think of back in August of 2006 when that girl sat in my lap, at the time, all I could think of was, huh, you know, I might be socially awkward, but at least I know that you're supposed to sit in chairs and, and not... not And not in other people's laps without asking them first. It's, it's not like the auditorium is particularly crowded. The Deering High School auditorium was never crowded, but especially during drama boot camp. There plenty of available seating options. Now she just chooses to sit in my lap with no provocation. Now I have a very awkward erection, and we have to rehearse a scene from Godspell. And it's very wrong for my character. Fuck. <laughs> oh well. Things have things have been turning in my favor lately, Lincolns. Things have been coming up con man lately. I have gotten thank you. Thank you. I have gotten some summer loving, folks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I am, uh, I'm not sure, I don't want to talk, I don't, don't want to dwell too much on my sex life, because there's nothing single men hate more than unattractive men talking about their sex lives. But I'm not going to get some guy riled up at me. Now there's some guy in the audience thinking, fuck, fat autistic juggalos are getting laid. Ugh! Damn it! God damn it! I can't explain it, folks. I attract a certain demographic, I guess. Women who are attracted to John Goodman on the early seasons of Roseanne. I clean up, clean up in that department. It's also important. It's also important that I'm super respectful of women. I'm super respectful of women and their needs. Thank you. Uh, which is why I never talk to them or make eye contact with them. I generally try to cross the street on the, when we're on the same side of the sidewalks. But, you know, if somebody just watched season three of Roseanne and wants to talk about it, I'm there. <laughs> I've been, there's a lot of trial and error in dating. A lot of trial and error. I've been on some bad dates. I went on a bad date at Chili's a couple months ago. <laughs> I think I was being a little particular. I'm not gonna, I'm telling this joke, I'll tell this joke, it's a cautionary tale. I am the antagonist in this story. I was in the wrong, I'll let you know that. I'm not condoning this behavior. We were at Chili's with a nice young lady. I, I was at Chili's, we weren't at, you might have been at Chili's that night. I was at Chili's on the main mall road with a nice young lady and uh, having a nice meal. $2.50 Bud Lights that night, half price nachos. The conversation was off to a good start. Uh, she asks me, Connor, what's your favorite type of music? And I say, well, I gotta say my absolute favorite type of music. I have to pick one. I love classic rock music. The classic rock hits of yesteryear and she says, great, I love classic rock too. Good. Conversation. Interactions. I volley, I volley back. I got, a, I got a chance to volley here. There's some tennis tournament going on now. I realize we're filming this, so I shouldn't have referenced whatever. U.S. Open, right? Ah, oh, whatever. Fuck it. As this is going on, the 2016 U.S. Open. Um, state of crime. Put it in a time frame. So I volley back to her. I said, great. Class, you love classic rock too. Something in common. Who is your favorite classic rock 
band, ma'am. And she says, my favorite classic rock band of all time is the Rolling Stones. Yeah. Good answer. I love the Rolling Stones. One of the most enduring rock and roll bands of all time. At least the second best rock and roll band of all time. Possibly the first. No, there's an argument to be had. Whatever. It's, we're filming. I gotta keep it tight. <laughs> Rolling Stones. Great. Awesome choice. What is your favorite Rolling Stones song of all time? And this is where the date goes wrong, because she responds, My favorite Rolling Stones song of all time is You Make a Grown Man Cry. Ugh. If you know the Rolling Stones even remotely, you know that the title of the song is not You Make a Grown Man Cry. And I could not contain my disgust at the Main Mall Chili's that night. Ma'am, the title of the song is not You Make a Grown Man Cry. The title of the song is Start Me Up. It's the lead-off track off their 1981 album, Tattoo You. It was one of the Rolling Stones' last major hits. It was also famously used in the advertising campaign of Windows 95. The name of the song is Start Me Up. And she says... Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know that. They say you make a grown man cry a lot in that song. I said, ma'am, they say start me up even more in that song. The very first thing they say in that song is start me up. This is the Rolling Stones. They're one of the most enduring, badass rock and roll groups of all time. They would not title one of their songs, You Make a Grown Man Cry. Maybe the Smiths or Dashboard Confessional would get away with doing that. But if Mick Jagger brought a song called You Make a Grown Man Cry to the table, Keith Richards would put a knife to his throat. I don't know if I can trust you. You say the Rolling Stones are your favorite classic rock group of all time, but you can't even get the title of one of their most famous songs of all time correctly. I don't even know if I can ask, I, I don't think I can even ask you a level two question, like who's your favorite Rolling Stones rhythm guitarist of all time? <laughs> a level two question, Brian Jones, is it Mick Taylor, is it Ron Wood? I can't ask that, let alone talk about the deep cuts. <laughs> Or the side projects like the New Barbarians, or we can't make fun of Mick Jagger's solo career. You probably have no idea where to find their lost 1974 documentary, Cocksucker Blues. I just feel like you've lied to me. You, you said the Rolling Stones are one of your favorite bands of all time, and you can't even get the title of the song correctly. And at that point, the manager of the Chili's has to pull me aside. Dan, the manager of the Chili's, Dan, the manager, we're on a first name basis. <laughs> Says, Connor, we love seeing you here. You're here four times a week. <laughs> but you have got to stop yelling at your mother's friend. <laughs> I said, Dan, that woman is 45 years old. I shouldn't be having to teach her about the Rolling Stones. It should be the other way around. But at that point, it was too late, despite the, 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 the romantic counseling of Dan, the Maine Mall Chili's manager. That woman left in the middle of the date, and the worst part is she hadn't even bought me dinner yet. <laughs> And then I realized, then I realized she was the one who drove me there. I realized I'd have to walk all the way back down the main mall road and then Outer Congress and Frost Street and Stevens Avenue, all the way back to Deering Center. And I got very upset. I was very upset. And the patrons at the main mall Chili's got to see that night what it looked like when a woman made a grown man cry. commercial break if this is on Comedy Central. Um, I got a few more left. Uh, 
I mentioned being respectful of women. I don't work in the most respectful environment, most feminist friendly environment. I work in a lot of kitchens. Work in a lot of kitchens. I always put it this way. Sometimes when you're spending your summers in Maine, you're eating lobster rolls and getting your duck dick sucked. And sometimes you're making lobster rolls and sucking dicks. <laughs> job's a job, and uh, gotta make money somehow. Uh, one of the chefs in the kitchen, he's a real kind of a skeezer guy. Skeezer guy. We all know these skeezer guys. He pulls three different times this summer. This chef pulls me aside and puts his arm around me and takes me out of the dish pit, and uh, he says, Connor, that waitress over there, I would love to eat ham salad out of her ass crack. <laughs> and first I was surprised that he thought this was such a great observation that he shares it with me not once, not twice, but three times. Second, I'm thinking that guy's on the fast track to being the head chef. <laughs> Because that is very cost-effective. Ham salad is a very cost-effective ingredient to do that. And logistically speaking, it's hard to eat something like lobster out of a girl's butt. Uh, you might find an exceptional, a girl with exceptionally strong butt cheeks who can crack the shells with them. But even then, it's hard to dip them, dip the pieces of lobster into a ramekin of butter with your butt cheeks. I don't know, I don't know. I didn't get the ham salad. Ham salad, I didn't get it. I was like, ham salad, mix up some old deli ham. Some mayonnaise, some relish, and just stick it in that girl's crack and go. recipe and I'm like I'm not sure if I want to eat that on a nice freshly baked dinner roll let alone out of somebody's butt <laughs> but it takes all types of people to make the world go around isn't that right Lincoln's? <laughs> so last Sunday me and the chef we were uh, prepping doing kitchen prep for the day he, he shared another observation with me it was good vibe Sunday morning the restaurant hadn't opened yet he was frying up Zeppeli which is uh, French Cajun for cinnamon donuts. He's frying up some Zeppelis. That was the dessert special that weekend. Cinnamon donuts, frying up Zeppelis. Cinnamon donuts for dessert special that weekend. And the kitchen smelled great that morning. That Sunday morning, we were having a good time listening to some Tattoo You, frying up Zeppelis, some cinnamon donuts. And he, he, uh, he stops what he's doing and he says, Connor, this is the second best smell in the entire world. I said, yeah, cinnamon donuts are an excellent smell. <laughs> Chef, I do have to ask, what do you consider to be the best smell in the entire world? Without any hesitation, he says, pussy. Uh, I had to respectfully disagree with the chef. Now ladies, ladies, no disrespect. I think pussy is a great smell in certain situations. In a finger blasting situation. That type of scenario, it's a great smell. Don't that be the best smell in the entire world. I think it has to be a great smell in any situation. If I smell cinnamon donuts at the bank, I'm like, fuck yes. I want to open up a checking account at this bank. smell pussy at the bank. I would just think, wow, this is a ratchet ass bank. Where do you hire these employees? How do you guys clean your money? 
says her FDIC insured on the front door, but I'm not certain. I'll put it one more way before I leave, Ellie. <laughs> I hope you like this. Uh, drive the analogy home further. If I pull down a girl's pants in a finger blasting situation, right before I'm about to sling the D, prep her up for that, and I smell cinnamon donuts, I say, heck yes. I am in for a good night. But if I go to Tim Hortons, What's wrong with these donuts? Some Somebody put too much yeast in these donuts. I think that's it for me. My name is Connor McGrath. Thank you, Lincolns. I'll bring it back to Aaron. <laughs>